Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. All right, book two of the Mage Winds trilogy. So now we have all of our players on stage. We have our lovely cover with Elspeth surrounded by Wirsa, which makes, I think, no sense because Elspeth doesn't ever face off with Wirsa, so I don't even know. Unless we're going to pretend that that's Skiff, but that would be silly. Anyways, um, so... Here we are uh, in the second book, and Elspeth in, and uh, Skiff, because Skiff, hey, remember Skiff? Skiff came along on this, and he has an intriguing story, which, among other things, bothers me a little bit in terms of internal consistency. Because Skiff's story, if you were to go by... Uh, Take a Thief, which is the book about how Skiff came to eventually be chosen and his upbringing. If you go by that, Skiff's mother loved him enough to make sure that he wasn't permanently indentured to his uncle, who was kind of a jerk. Um, and eventually Skiff left his uncle and wound up joining up with... Basie and his group of thieves, and he lived with Basie and was one of Basie's little crowd of thieves until the day that a awful person burned down uh, the building. Then all and basically Skiff's makeshift thieving family, and so Skiff then decides to get revenge, and in the process of getting revenge, uh, winds up getting chosen, becomes good friends in his own strange way with Harold Alberic. And uh, that's that's Skiff's story and how he wound up, you know, at the uh, Collegium in order to become very good friends with Talia in, in uh, Arrows of the Queen. But in this book, in this book, Skiff basically says... And in this book and the previous book, Skiff basically informs us, the reader, that his mother was some kind of a drunk and somewhat abusive and was the one who made him a thief. That the story that he tells in this is not actually consistent with Take a Thief. And it bothers me because it speaks to Mercedes Lackey having fallen down on paying attention to her own story. Now, Skiff in this is also a little extraneous, um, in that his story is, his story in, is, is kind of secondary because it's kind of just, it feels like it's been put there in order to give Falcon's Bane's daughter, Niara, a sort of a, a reason to be where she winds up being. See, Falcon's Bane, our grand villain, among other things, insisted on getting himself a daughter who he then used basically as kind of an experiment. Um... He wanted to make himself look like a giant cat person. So before he did anything to himself, he would test it out on her and perfect the whatever he was doing on her. There is also a lot of talk of incest. It's very, very clear that was going on. Um, anyhow, so in the last book, Niara fled her father, only it turned out that he had basically arranged it so that she would think she was escaping, but he had arranged it so that he could try to get an in with the Teledras. But she manages to turn on him anyhow properly, and uh, they think they've defeated him. And then in this book, she takes off with the sword Need, because Need in the first book had finally woken up and gained consciousness, and it turns out that Need is actually the soul of an old uh, priestess smith mage uh, who 
in the times before the Mage Wars, had managed to basically stick herself into a sword in order to rescue a bunch of novices from the temple that she had been living in. Um, and then across the centuries had eventually, in effect, fallen asleep. And it wasn't until she was having constant arguments while well, half asleep, so to speak, with Carowin and with Elspeth, it wasn't until then that she finally actually woke up enough to, well, in effect, regain consciousness and become herself. But Need, realizing once they had reached the Tele address, once Elspeth had somebody to teach her magic, she realized that Niara needed her more. So she and Niara take off, and Need sets herself to helping Niara become better, become a person, become independent, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's kind of a second string story. It's interesting in its way, but it very much runs parallel to what's going on in a way that it's kind of like there are two books going on at the same time in Winds of Change. There's the story of Skiff and uh, Wintermoon, who are, I believe it's Wintermoon, who are hunting after to find Nyara. Oh, look, see, look in the corner there, the zoom. That's because I had stuck my mouse there when I was taking, when I was dead getting my screen caps. Anyways, um,. So there's, it's a hummingbird because they wind up using hummingbird to get in contact with the nearest uh, Teledras, uh, the nearest Teledras veil that is not Kashena because Kashena is their veil, is the veil of the Teledras clan that uh, is involved in this particular book. And... Uh, so there they are, and uh, they have to send for help. So what they do is they basically pack a heck of a lot of magic onto a hummingbird and then send the hummingbird off to find the nearest group of people who have someone who might help them. And, uh, yeah, so that's why a hummingbird. This is a picture of Niara holding Need. And so, um, as you may be able to tell, I don't know, Niara is, well, a cat girl, and Need is the magic talking sword. Um, and, oh, I didn't even realize that I had gotten my, my mouse in there again. Oh, well. Uh, so, that's Griffins. We'll leave the Griffins up for a while. Anyways, it's in this book that we finally get an explanation of what the Griffins are doing there. The Griffins are the leading edge of the returning Kaleda in. See, back in the Mage Wars, there was only one group, the Kaleda in, and they were sort of like one group with a bunch of clans. At the end of the Mage Wars, the Kaleda in basically got split. You had a whole bunch of Griffins and random people, and the Kalatia. Kaleda in clan. And those are the ones that we follow uh, at the end of Black Griffin. Those are the ones who settle in the city of White Griffin in the city of White Griffin in, well, the White Griffin, the second book of the Mage Wars trilogy. And those are the people that we continue to follow in Silver Griffin in that last book of that trilogy. Um, but the rest of the Kaleda in there were a whole bunch of other Kaleda in tribes. And they came home. And home was a gigantic hole in the ground. Because what had happened was the magical equivalent of a nuclear bomb going off. And so home was a gigantic crater. It was a gigantic crater, the bottom of which had been just solidly fused into rock. And outside of that gigantic crater was a massive amount of land that had been permanently and horrifically twisted by magic. That you had things like animals that had gotten planted knee-deep in the ground and were sort of like half-animal, half-plant, and plants that were trying to eat people in, you know, kind of an Audrey II sort of way. And it was just all kinds of horrible. And the clans both petitioned the goddess Kalanel, 
And from that, those two groups, because they split up, because one group said, we're never using magic again. Look what magic did. It turned our home into a crater. And the other group said, uh, how exactly are we going to survive without magic in this place that has been permanently twisted by magic? And so the two groups split up and they prayed and they did some you know, sacrifices to prove their sincerity. And Kalanel said, you guys who are giving up magic, fine, you're giving up magic. You will become the Shinna Inn. You will live on these planes. I will fix this gigantic crater and turn it into a place that's more or less livable. And that's where you're going to live. And you guys over here who are not giving up magic, well, you get to have enough magic to survive this but now I'm giving you a job of fixing all of the crap that went wrong around here. So the Griffins are the leading edge of the returning lost tribe. See, it's the lost tribe of Israel. There you go. And that's what they're doing here. So we have this, this book that is working up to the grand climax in the Mage Storms trilogy as we sort of, we get the we get a reunion of the clans. We get all of these groups who are finally coming back together. The Sundering will slowly recede. And while we have that going on, uh, we have Falcon's Bane decides to make another set of tries to take things over. We also get this guy, Firesong. Firesong, who is... Occasionally pretends to be chaotic neutral, but he isn't really. He's a really, really great guy. He's just a preternaturally handsome, preternaturally talented at magic, a great healing adept, and a child prodigy. And uh, he is the guy who gets sent in response to uh, their in response to the hummingbird. And he's the guy who is going to train Elspeth and is going to train Darkwind and is going to fix uh, and is going to fix the problem with the Heartstone, which has become vaguely malicious and kind of horrifying and scary. He is also a cousin umpty squillion times removed from Elspeth because Vaniel fathered several children at the request of people who wanted children. He fathered Jiza, who was part of the line of succession, wound up being part of the family, the royal family of Valdemar, and is thus Elspeth's umpty squillion number of greats grandmother, as well as being the parent to a couple of children in, uh, among the Teledras. And he is Firesong's great-great-grandfather, biologically speaking. And so Firesong shows up, and there's a bit of a back and forth because he is fascinating and super handsome. And uh, he winds up basically forcing Elspeth and Darkwind to face down to the fact that one, Elspeth is, yeah, she's kind of sort of crushing on him until he says, yeah, well, I'm actually... He's actually gay, and really, I'm more interested in your boyfriend than you. And uh, so there's that, which, you know, gets Darkwind over his jealousy and puts Elspeth through a ream of jealousy because she's like, well, why would Darkwind want me when he could go out with somebody who's that handsome and fascinating? And uh, he does, and Firesong does some incredible feats of magic and is remarkably obnoxious at times. Um, he really kind of needs a smack, and uh, while he has a few moments that kind of shake him in these books, I don't think he really gets his big smack until the Mage Storms trilogy. But he has a few smacks in this book, in this trilogy, I suppose. Anyway, uh, he is kind of the last of the major players uh, to appear. And uh, it's in the next book that we basically go through the whole process of setting the stage for the Mage Storms trilogy. So 
Uh, that's everything, and I'll see you all next week.